So it just like takes forever to return. In fact, actually literally forever to return. Um, then now you're not gonna make progress on any other futures. You're not gonna check your timers. You're not gonna check your reactor. And so it's just gonna get stuck. That is problematic. Even in the, even in the, the stealing world, um, imagine that here this thread starts computing pi. Then now it's not even gonna wake up the stolen futures. So it might be it might have given some stuff away that that's not gonna make progress either. And you've basically now sort of lost a core and anything that's stuck, so um, let's do like yellow. Imagine that there's some futures down here that no one ends up stealing because no one is, everyone else has their own work to do. These futures down here, no one is gonna steal, but this thread is stuck just computing pi. Now, these futures, we're just gonna, never gonna do anything with. Even if all the other threads are sitting idle, right? They're not going to steal it because they see that this queue is pretty short. Now there might be ways around this, but you could see how if a future takes a really long time, uh, then this is problematic. Uh, and what uh, Brian is mentioning here is there is this a, there's a mechanism in Tokyo uh, that's relatively new uh, where you can call Tokyo blocking or technically it's in Tokyo Executor, but blocking, which is you sort of mark the current pool thread as, hey, I'm doing a bunch of work, so steal everything I have. It basically sort of lets go of its own queue and says everyone else deal with it. Uh, so that I wanted to mention. There's another thing to mention, which is uh, I mentioned how futures get returned to their, their original queue because otherwise they would have to get wakeups from this other thread. Uh, there is a change that we want to make in Tokyo but haven't yet, which is how about instead of doing that, uh, wrong color, or any other colors, green. Green is not ideal for this, but let's use green, fine. Uh, here, no, not, not green, pink. Uh, what if instead of doing that, we just sort of move the part of the reactor that's related to the futures we stole over here. That way we don't have to return the futures. We can just keep them here. It turns out that this, this pink stuff, uh, we don't really know how to do yet because it means that you have to move stuff from, we have sort of epoll running in thread one and we have epoll in thread three. And it means that in this set to epoll and this set to epoll, we have to take like the part of this epoll that is related to the thing we stole and we have to move it to this one. And Tokyo doesn't have a way to do this yet, but it's something we're looking into how to add. Uh, can you repeat, repeat why it's returning the future after it stole the future? Right, so that's a little bit what I got into here, but the, the reason is um, because otherwise we would have to do this. So in th thread three steals a future from thread one then now thread one, because it still has the, the resource, the thing that notifies that future, then now three can't make progress without one telling it what to do. And then you have to sort of bounce back and forth between the two with these notifies. Whereas instead what we're gonna do is three is gonna do the compute part, so do the poll, and then it's gonna return it to one so that one can just do the wakeups locally instead. Uh, I'd also like to learn more about Tokyo blocking. Yeah, so I, th I think I got roughly into the idea of blocking. I don't want to go too much into detail in part because the design there is still evolving. Like blocking doesn't work for current thread runtimes at the moment. Um, does reactor run in the same thread? Um, yes, yes. So the reactor uh, here, the reactor. So every thread in the pool also has a reactor. Remember, the reactor doesn't do reads or writes, right? Those are done in poll. All they do is epoll and notify. Uh, the up until, I mean, I can find out. Uh, to, no. Tokyo. Uh, 
up until this landed in October, uh, it used to be, so before this awesome PR landed, um, it used to be that Tokyo actually started, sure, we'll keep the same color, started like an extra thread that just had a reactor. And then there was, in, in that version of the world, um, lime green. This is, again, this is not what Tokyo does anymore after that PR, but it used to like not have these, not have reactors in every thread. Instead, it had a single thread that was the reactor for all the futures that would then sort of do all these wake ups. Uh, and this works relatively well if you don't have a lot of things to do, but uh, what you run into is if you have lots and lots of connections, then now it might be your bottleneck by just waking them up. Like there's so much work to do that this thread is just really busy waking everyone up, but everyone can't make progress until they're woken up. And so this becomes a major bottleneck. Um, and so that's also why uh, a while ago I wrote, uh, and some of you may have seen it, this thing called Tokyo IO pool. And Tokyo IO pool uh, was essentially this design of having a reactor per executor, but I didn't have any work ceiling. I just had, I just spun up a bunch of current thread runtimes and they all just ran individually and then spawning was random. And then later, uh, Stepan came in and uh, uh, implemented this PR, which changes the design of Tokyo to the one we talked about where there's work stealing and there's a reactor per pool. And that brings uh, Tokyo pretty close to Tokyo IO pool um, because now you have many reactors. And then they also made this change which is being able to spawn tax onto random workers as opposed to a single one. And now you see that uh, thread pool, so Tokyo IO pool uh, takes about 34, what is this, uh, milliseconds? Micros, millis. Uh, 34 millis to wake up. And with this PR, Tokyo proper takes 46. So there's a lot of work in Tokyo to try to make this fast. Um, and the design, they've basically the only thing that's really missing now is the ability to do this move, right? Of moving the, uh, when you steal a future, also steal it's the part of its reactor that's relevant. Uh, great. Uh, okay, so I think, I think that's most of what I wanted to say about Tokyo. Um, there's maybe one thing missing, which is, uh, a timer per, yeah, so there's a timer per pool worker set. So they have both a reactor and a timer. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to say about Tokyo, which is, uh, I've s sort of lied to you in that I've said that everything is epoll. Whereas in reality, uh, epoll is just a thing you use on Linux. So epoll is Linux specific. Uh, in reality, what Tokyo does is it uses a crate called Mayo. So Mayo is a crate that's written by the, the same guy who maintains Tokyo. And it's basically, um, you can think of it as a, an abstraction for doing the kind of things that epoll does. Right, so it's a low level library for non-blocking APIs and event notifications. It just, on any operating system, it gives an interface that basically gives you a way to say, I want to wait for all of these resources, these IO resources. Um, okay, so let's now close the book on Tokyo. I think that gives you an idea of how Tokyo works. And there's really no more magic to it than that. There are a lot of optimizations internally, but now you understand everything that Tokyo does. There's nothing more to it. Uh, in fact, if you look at the things that Tokyo uh, gives out, clock is a way to deal with time that's not related to systems time, so it makes testing easier. Um, codec is probably gonna be removed, but it's basically a way to... Uh, if you have something that is read and write um, or async, so we, we can talk about async read and write actually, because they're a little bit interesting maybe. Um, so 
there's these traits called async read and async write. Really what async read and async write are is saying that something is read or write. So a TCP stream or a file or whatever is read or write. But with, if it's async read, so if you look at async read, it really just uh, is just a trait over read and all the methods are already implemented for you. So you don't have to add any methods. All it is is read with the additional contract that it's non-blocking. That if you try to do a read, it will never block. It will just return would block. And async write is the same. So async read and async write are very straightforward. And then codec is just a way to map uh, async read and async write into sync and stream. I guess we can mention sync and stream now. So these are not Tokyo specific concepts. Uh, they're just related to futures in general. So a stream is, ooh, there's a lot of stuff here. Let's get rid of all of it. Great. Uh, a stream, is, actually we don't even need to draw. Just open it. Uh, I don't want that, I want stream. A stream, is very similar to a future. It has an item and an error, uh, the, and it also has a poll method. It also uses the poll type. It also has item and error, but notice that as opposed to the future, as opposed to futures, so future, if you recall, uh, has uh, just returns an item. This returns an option item. And also the contract of poll is you're allowed to call poll after it returns ready poll on future, if it returns ready, you shouldn't call poll again because the thing is already finished. On stream, if you call poll, it's going to give you either some or none. If it turns to some and some item, then think of this as an iterator. Then that means the stream gave you another thing. If it returns not ready, it means I'm not ready to give you another thing yet. And if it returns none, it means I'm finished. Just like an iterator. This is like the next method of an iterator. And the contract here is that if poll returns ready none, then you shouldn't poll anymore because there's nothing more. It's sort of finished. Uh, tangential question. How does someone profile Rusko to figure out what this, that the single executor was the bottleneck with many connections? Uh, the single reactor, you mean. Uh, so this was actually a part of my research where I'm writing a really high performance database. And so we have lots of connections. And we noticed that as you increase the number of clients, uh, the throughput was not increasing with the number of clients, even though we know that the underlying database does scale. And so clearly there was some bottleneck. And then what you do is you just run top or H top or something. And what you see is there's a single thread that's at hundred percent CPU and the other threads are not busy. And then you try to figure out what is that thread. And that thread was the reactor thread. So it's called like IO, Tokyo IO or something. And so that led me down, it basically led me down to start talking to the Tokyo team and be like, hey, what's going on here? Why is there one thread and the other threads are not doing work? Um, and in fact, uh, you, you can look at the implementation of Tokyo IO pool because it is really straightforward. Um, Tokyo IO pool. So the implementation of Tokyo IO pool is I think a single file because I'm a terrible programmer. Uh, it's a single file, great. It's mostly documentation uh, and like builders and whatnot. And so the build method that gives you a runtime is really, really stupid. It creates a channel. Uh, it spawns for, uh, for each, for as many workers as you want. Uh, it spawns a thread. That thread is a current thread runtime and uh, it all it really does is it receives on a channel and everything it receives, it spawns. Uh, sorry, uh, let me rephrase. It spins up a current thread runtime. It sends a handle to that runtime back to the thing that's starting all the threads. So it's gonna end up with one handle to each current thread runtime. Uh, so all of those are returned those threads are just going to block on a signal to exit. And then a handle is really just a, uh, a, uh, a set of handles. So one handle for every current thread runtime, and it's just going to spawn on one of them. That is basically the entire implementation. Very little magic. Uh, right. So stream is basically just a future that you can pull more than once after it, when it's ready. Uh, and it, it basically just gives you an iterator and then sync is 
sort of like the inverse. So a sink is something that you can stuff stuff into. Uh, it's like a, it's like a channel sender, but it's asynchronous. So uh, remember how uh, if you have a or if you have a channel from a sender to a receiver, right? And there's usually, uh, if you make an unbounded channel, this will never happen. So let's talk about a bounded one. So you have a bounded channel and imagine that all of these slots are full, right? So now the sender tries to send another X, but this is full. What will happen in the normal sort of non-futures world is that this sender will now block until the receiver takes something off. And now this slot is free again. And now this X can go into there and therefore it's no longer blocking. Uh, and so the blocking world, this is all fine. Uh, but of course in futures, we're not allowed to block. Like if you, if in pole you block, it's basically the same as if you ran forever, you really don't want to block. And so the sender and the receiver, if you have this setting, uh, then a sync, anything that implements sync has a, uh, a start send. I'm going to not talk about start send because it's annoying. Uh, instead, I'm just going to say this. Um, uh, instead, there's a send uh, that takes a T, or in this case, I guess an X, uh, and it returns like poll ready. That's, this is an angle bracket. Uh, what am I doing? This type is not helpful. Um, there's a poll, uh, async, sure, uh, async of nothing. And the error I think is nothing as well. And so the idea is that you try to send this X and it will tell you whether it succeeded or not, but it will never block, right? So if this is full, it's just going to say not ready and then set, notify the task whenever the receiver has taken something off. So your send will later succeed. Remember, we always have to satisfy the, the contract of not ready means you've arranged for yourself to be woken up. So if I try to send and it's currently full, I put sort of a marker here so that the receiver, when they remove this thing, they noti notice the marker and then they notify my task. So that the next time I basically I'm woken up again, and asked to send again, and then the uh, the definition here is really uh, async sync of T, um, which is either ready uh, with no, with contains nothing or not ready, uh, which returns the T. So the idea here is that if you try to send and it fails, it gives you back the thing you tried to send so you can try again later. Uh, so here, if we look at sync, uh, you'll notice that sync has also an item and error. They're prefixed for uninteresting reasons. Uh, they've split send into start send and poll complete so that you can send, you can send things in batches. Like I can start send three X's and then I can wait for the, all three to complete. But the basic interface is you pull, this is where you get back the thing uh, and you pull and it tells you when the, when the send is completed. Uh, so that's stream and sync. Sync is a little weird because we don't have like stream is basically the same as iterator, but sync doesn't have a good parallel. It's basically just a channel sender that is asynchronous. Um, okay, so that's futures, Tokyo, sync, and stream. So now we go into Rust going forward with this. In particular, there is this RFC it's generated a lot of discussion. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into the discussion because it's not relevant to what we're going to talk about. Um, but this proposes moving uh, all, everything related to futures from the futures crate into the standard library. So that is task and future. Uh, and if we look at the render RFC, it basically proposes, um, this is a worthwhile RFC to read. Um, but it proposes adding poll, which we've looked at. It's just ready or not ready. 
uh, wake, which is like notify. Uh, it's basically just a thing that allows you to know. I don't know why they called it wake instead of notify. It's not important. Uh, but it's uh, if you have an awake, then you can wake something up and say, hey, like, you, it's basically the same as notify, right? Wake means you might be able to make progress now. So the contract now is if you return pending, the function must also ensure that the current task is scheduled to be awoken where progress can be made. So it's the same contract, just substitute notify for wake. Um, that's fine. That's an example. That's an example. And then the future trait. So let's, I guess, contrast this with the one in futures. Okay, so this is the trait that we have in futures, right? It has item, error, and this method for poll. The proposed thing to standardize is there's an output type, but notice there's not, there's not a distinction between item and error. There's just, uh, I guess I can zoom in here a little, sorry about that. Uh, there's a future type, it has an output associated type, and output does not necessarily need to have an error. It's basically the observation here. That, and the, the reason for this is there are some futures that just cannot error. Like if you wait for a timeout, then you're, there's no meaningful error. Or if you compute a hash, then like eventually the hash is going to be ready. It's not a matter of erroring. And so the argument here is you're going to have some value that you get eventually. And of course, there's a trivial mapping between future between the futures future and the standard library future, which is just to say output is result of your your okay and your error type. Uh, whereas this forces you into, in many cases, to declare sort of a dummy error type. This does not do that. Instead, it just says, if your thing can fail, then your output is gonna be a result. Uh, the poll method, so that's why there's only one associated trait. And then of course the only other thing on future is poll. Uh, poll in the standard library version of future looks fairly different, but we're gonna talk to what that means. So let's look at the return type first. The return type is poll of the output. So here the, it was a poll of item and error, but because we got rid of error, it is now just poll output. So that seems pretty nice. Um, you're given an, uh, a local waker uh, local waker is basically the same as what you would get from task current, right? So in futures, remember how if you ever want to be woken up again, you have to call task current to get a handle to yourself, to like a thing that lets you wake up yourself that you can then give away, like to the reactor, for example. In the standard library version of futures, that thing for wake up is... Um, uh, is passed in explicitly. It is not something that you, that's like passed magically somehow. Because think about this, it's a little bit magical, right? What we're saying is that poll, if you're in poll, then you can call this magical function and get a task, right? So if we go back to the executor, remember how we had to pull a little bit of a trick to call this with notify function. And with notify is really just gonna like, hide away this this notifier that we give it somewhere that poll that task current can get at it in fact the way this actually works is uh it uses thread locals so rustless's notion and the general programming concept that uh, you can have thread local storage so some stuff that just the current thread has stashed away somewhere um, and with notify just sets a, a thread local variable that's sort of global to the pro or global to the thread uh, that contains notify and task current reads that. Whereas in the standard library implementation, you just instead say that whenever you call poll, you have to give it a handle to itself or a handle to its waker. Um, and so there's no longer any need for this task current, the thread local stuff and that magic. It does mean that poll is a little bit more verbose, but it also means there's less magic. Uh, it also means you don't need thread locals, which can be a little bit of a pain to implement in certain execution environments. Um, but this is also a, generally a, a good change and it, it maps very directly to uh, what we had in the old futures, just with slightly different mechanics, but the, the underlying principles are the same. 
And then we get to self. So in the old futures, bring us back to that. Um, poll, just take mute self. All well and good. In the standard library futures, it takes pin mute self. Uh, I'm trying to see what the right way to introduce this is. Um, sorry, before we get to that, are there any questions of everything leading up to this? Because this is about to be another sort of break to something that is relatively different. So if you have any questions about all the stuff we've talked about sort of from the middle of Tokyo to here, now's the time. You can ask them later too, but now's a natural sort of break point. Or about local waker or I don't remember self can be specified with a type. Um, oh yeah. So uh, that's actually not a feature that's specific to this. Um, uh, that is uh, Rust arbitrary self types. This, one. this is an RFC that landed a while ago. Um, but it hasn't been stabilized at all yet. Uh, doesn't have an RFC. Yeah, so the basic idea is that you can uh, have self be not just directly a, a mute self or a res, ref self or self. You can also declare self to be something that depends on the self type. Um, and this would be, you can only call this method if you have an RC of self. So if you just have a ref self, you could not call this method. This basically declares that I am callable on an an, uh, an item of this type, but only if it is in the following form. Uh, and so that's what this is using. It's saying that you can only call poll on self or, or on an item of this type if the type you have is a pin mute self. Otherwise, you cannot call poll. Yeah, it's really neat. Uh, I think it's currently behind a feature. It's implemented in everything. There's some question about trait objects that are still being resolved. Um, but it's basically you add this feature and then you can do it. Uh, I don't think you should generally need it, but um, does it work with anything generic over self? Uh, yeah, I think the proposal is, I'm not entirely sure. So this is one of the things they're still working out and why it hasn't been stabilized. But um, I think it's the requirement is anything that derefs into self. Um, it might even say here somewhere. Uh, right, so that's the original thing. Um, yeah, basically there's a lot of questions around object safety and trait objects that we're not going to get into here, but I wanted to see if I could find But yeah, the, the basic idea is uh, that you want something that derefs to self. Uh, and whether that's deref or deref mute or sort of deref owned, but it has to be able to be turned into self. Okay, so it doesn't look like there are any particular questions about Tokyo or future stuff leading up to this. So let's look at pin. Um, pin is there for async await. I'm trying to think whether we should deal with async await first or talk about pin first. Um, I think we need to talk about async await first. So let's do that. Um, async await is a feature that a lot of people have been anticipating for a long time for Rust. And it gives us two things that are kind of neat. Uh, so here's what it gives us. Um, imagine that you're actually, we can do it with our example from up here. So writing this for uh, Futex is fine, right? Like it's, but there is a bunch of noise here. We have to write all this and then stuff. And furthermore, it's a little awkward because imagine that we have something like a buffer that 
case foobar. Uh, and or in fact, we like read it from the from the user's input or something. Uh, I don't have a. This is currently a static string, which is annoying. But imagine that this is like a. This is really a string. Sure. That's not what I meant. And then what we want to write is really what's in buff. You can't really do this because the future you get back is going to be tied to this lifetime. But that future we're going to like give to Tokyo Run. Uh, no, I haven't really introduced it yet. We're about to. Um, if we're going to take this future now and sort of give it away to a thread pool to operate on, but this, um, I guess, let's imagine that this also uses. Or like we want to keep using buff down here, right? Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something like Tokyo spawn few decks, uh, or sure spawn. It's not important. I do, I like send off few decks to be executed somewhere. Uh, but then I also after that, uh, actually, sure run. I want to do this. Right? So I'm gonna, I'm really just giving a reference to buff to this future. And then when it finishes, I want to do something with buff. Or you can imagine that I have buff and I want to use it in multiple parts of, uh, of this future execution. That gets pretty annoying. Um, in fact, you can't really do it very nicely. And even, even if you ignore those kind of things, like this is, is a weird way to write this code. Like I have to do all this like chaining of and thens. So async await um, tries to make all of that better by introducing two new keywords to the language. Uh, well, it's called them keywords. So it introduces one new keyword, which is async and a macro called await. Um, and what that lets you do is it allows you to write code the following way. The stuff above, so a few decks, we can write it, in this case, this is an async block. You can also mark functions that async and closures as async. Um, so we declare, declare this as an asynchronous block. And inside of this, we can say uh, await, uh, await, TCP stream connect. And then we want to await dot write buff. Actually, let's just not use this for now. It's not terribly important. Just to demonstrate that this is annoying. Uh, we're gonna write foobar, and then we're gonna await uh, c dot read. Uh, read. I guess b. And then we're going to check if B is bar food. So async await lets us write the code that's above this way. So notice that now we've taken this sort of chaining and callback based thing and written it as linear code. Now there's some discussion about a way await being becoming like a keyword. So you can do something like this, um, makes it a little bit easier to read maybe, but for now it's just a macro so that we can iterate on the design. Um, and this is pretty cool uh, in particular because now this code is just a lot easier to read. Like it reads like the corresponding synchronous code. Um, it's also really handy for writing functions. So whereas before um, I would have to sort of write a, an FN like check foo bar, right? That returns Either I could say that it returns like an impulse future, and then I could do all of this like and then business that we did above, or I could write a check foo bar that is like a foo bar check future, and then here, and then I declare some like enum foo bar check future, and it can be either like connecting, in which case it has a. TCP stream connect future, uh, or it can be like writing 
which has a write future, or it can be reading, which has a read future, uh, and then, or it can be, you know, let's say that, and then I have to like impl future for this foobar check future, and all of that just gets such a pain, right? Impl future helped a lot, as we can see, but it still requires you to write all this and then business, and it's still really annoying. In this new world, I can just say fn async check foobar. And that's going to impl future. And then I just write this code with a wait, and it will just work. And notice how similar this is to the synchronous code. And that is basically the goal. But you might wonder, well, how is this actually going to work? Like, what does this turn into? Ultimately, this code sort of has to turn into a future somehow. So what does it actually do? Well, uh, async, um, what async does is basically construct a type for you that is an enum. Uh, sorry, let me rephrase that a little bit. Async constructs a type for you that is a future. Uh, and it will run from the previous await point to the next one every time it can make progress. So in this case, when you initially create this block, no codes gets executed. It just, it's just a future. Uh, then the first time this async block, the, the returned future gets pulled, it's gonna start running from the start of the block until it hits the first await. Uh, that first await, of course, contains a future or is given a future as an argument, and it's going to pull that future. If that future is ready, then it keeps executed until the next await. If that future is not ready, then it's going to sort of keep track of where it got to. So uh, the first time this gets executed, uh, like the first time, it's going to be there. The second time, it's going to call TCP stream connect. Uh, and then it's gonna notice that when we pull them on the connect, it's not ready yet because it, it just initially started connecting. So the second time we're sort of stuck here. Then we're gonna pull again, pull on async future, resumes here, and it sort of turns this into a loop. Uh, so await, if we look at it, uh, await basically sort of kind of desugars sugars into this uh, ignore the pin of future stuff for now uh, it basically desugars sugars into a loop that pulls on the asynchronous future so down here this is sort of kind of going to destructure into uh, this uh, if it's uh, ready then we sort of I guess ready with x then we sort of yield x, so we return that out of the loop. And if it's not ready, all right, fine, let's do it the other way around. Uh, then we break with x out of the loop. And if it's not ready, we yield. So think of this as we sort of store how far we got, and then we, uh, and then we return from the future saying not ready. The next time the async block, so imagine there's a Imagine that, oh, this is going to be easier. Sorry, just uh, for exposition. Uh, imagine we finish the connect, and then this, we're like now stuck on the, stuck on the read. Sure, let's say we're stuck on the read. So we finished the two things above, and we're now on this part. So this is going to desugar into something that's kind of a little bit sort of like this. Uh, match C read. Uh, if it is OK, async ready x, then we're going to break with x. Uh, we're going to break with OK x. Oh, I guess now there's no break, break x. Uh, if it's uh, async not ready and we're going to yield and that's what we're going to do so that's basically what the await kind of sort of sugars into now there are a couple of things that are interesting about this 
notice that there's a bunch of code above this loop, right? So when we here, if we sort of think that a return's not ready, think of it sort of kind of like that. It's like the future that we get back from async, if we get to this point, then we're gonna return not ready. But it can't really be not ready, right? Because if we return not ready, uh, not really. If we return not ready, then the next time this async block would be pulled, it would execute from the top of the scope, which means it would re-execute these pieces of code, which is clearly not okay, right? We have already executed that. So this is why it sort of needs to be the special kind of yield operation, right? It can't really be a return because that would imply re issuing all of these. Instead, we're gonna yield and yield we're gonna declare to be sort of a special operation that means remember where I returned from. And when I get called again, then continue from here. Continue from here on poll or on re-entry, right? So when I re-enter this block, when poll is called again, then continue from here as opposed to from the top. And what this means is if we continue from here, then of course, uh, so we get notified of some kind, a poll gets called again, we continue from here. This is what's known as uh, continuations, basically. Um, then we're gonna sort of follow the bottom, follow the control loop. So we come to the loop, we do the loop again, and now we do c.read. And now it may or may not be ready, but at least it means we didn't re-execute the stuff that's up here, right? Which is what we wanted. And then of course, eventually it's gonna return ready, then we give back the x and now b is, that value that was ready, and we can continue down here. So that's the basic idea of async await, that we need this ability to continue from where we, where we stopped. But if you look at it, that is really quite complicated because first of all, we need to note where we return from, but more importantly, when we continue, where does C come from? We've returned, right? So has C just gone away? C we got from here but we somehow need C in order to continue from here. We don't get to re-execute this code. And this is where async await gets tricky uh, because C here is sort of like, where is C even stored, right? It's sort of stored on the stack, but, but the stack is gonna go away when we return. So where is C stored? And so what async really does is async basically turns into this pattern down here. Probably gonna do this, but mention the word generator. Uh, so I don't really wanna mention the word generator because it isn't really a generator. Uh, it sort of is a generator. So for those of you coming from JavaScript and Python, uh, it sort of is like a generator in that a generator also has to continue but it's also not quite a generator because it's asynchronous. Um, and so it needs to deal with things like wakeups. Uh, but it is continuation passing in the same style as generators. Um, there is in fact in the uh, document or in the RFC for async await, there is in fact down here somewhere, uh, async based generators like here, um, that async function should be the syntax for creating generators. Uh, that's not what they've chosen to do, but you're, you're right. The mechanisms are pretty much the same. Um, so, sorry, so what async really does is it uses a pattern similar to what we sort of started writing out here for this very verbose check foo bar, except the compiler is gonna generate it for you. So when it looks at this code, it's gonna generate an enum like uh, compiler made async block with like some unique identifier that is unknown only to the compiler, right? And so this is not a type that you will ever see, right? The async block is really just gonna return an impl future, right? But in reality, this is really compiler made async block, whatever. And the compiler is gonna generate an impl future for, uh, future for this compiler made async block. I guess I don't actually need the unique identifier. It's gonna be confusing. Um, 
but the compiler is going to generate all this. Um, and so you will never see this type. It'll be an entirely private type to the compiler, but it's going to generate this enum. And what this enum is going to be is sort of like a, think of it as like a step zero. So step zero is before the first time you pull, so there's no state, uh, sort of. There's no state except whatever the async block may have captured from its environment, right? So if there's a bar here, like a new whatever, and here we like, I don't know, do something so that we pull bar in, then step zero would also contain a vec. See, this is a... Uh, then step zero also contains a vec bool. So it's like everything that's needed for the before you even start that you capture from your environment. And then for every await, it's going to generate a new step. So there's going to be a step one. Uh, and step one in our case is the await on TCP stream connect. Right? And inside of each variant, it's going to store all the stuff that it has made so far. In our case, that would, I guess, be Z at this point. Uh, and it would also be the connect future. Right? So it's going to have some type. Because the first time we call connect, we're going to get back a future that we're going to have to keep polling, right? Connect gives you back a future. And here we're saying await that future. So we're going to have to store that future somewhere. And that's going to be here. Um, and that's going to be, if we're stuck on step one, we're going to keep polling the sort of, I guess this is really going to be something like waiting on. And anytime you pull on a step, you're really pulling on whatever that waiting on is. So this is going to be some impl future. Uh, and the, the output, is going to be something that step two needs, right? It's not really going to be a step two, but it's like needs this, right? So you can think of it as a step two. Here, uh, step two is going to be, well, it's still going to have the Z. So let's just like say that all these have Z ignored from now because it's not used. Uh, it is, however, going to keep the C, which is going to be the the TCP stream, because at this point we do have the C, right? Because step one was a future that we finished polling on well, that eventually gave us the TCP stream. And then in step two, when we get to this await point, now we already have the TCP stream because this poll eventually returned ready. So this TCP stream we now have. Uh, and then what this is gonna store is another sort of waiting on, and that's gonna be an impl future whose output is going to be like u size. So this, this is um, future returned, the future that's returned from c.write. But we have to be a little bit careful here because um, or we might start to wonder what's going on here because c.write takes a mutable reference to c, right? This impl future it's going to sort of not quite consume C, but it needs C. And so it's sort of tied to the lifetime of C. But C is stored here. So this internally contains a reference to C, but C is stored in ourselves. And for those of you who sort of have dealt a little bit with this, this is known as a self-referential data type. So uh, imagine I have some type foo, and inside I have some data. And data is say evacuate. And then I also want to do store like a self ref, which is going to be a slice. It's going to be a last two or something. Uh, half. And half is going to be a slice into data. Right? So half is a pointer into ourselves. I guess a better example of this actually for reasons that will become clear later. So I have a data that's like a, a, a 
buffer that's stored inside of foo and half is going to point to half of that data. But this is really weird because imagine that we have some code that looks like f is foo. How do I even make this? Right, so, so this is going to be something like 0, 1024. How do I set this? How do I set that type? I don't know how to set it. Right, the, I don't have a reference to foo yet. And let's say that, imagine that somehow I managed to create it in the first place. Now I do, say, z, it's going to be box new f. So I'm moving f. So now, instead of f being on the stack, f is now on the heap. But now, uh, f dot half, or rather, z dot half, is still pointing to the stack. It's still pointing to where f was. Because I haven't, in this move, I haven't updated half. So half is now a pointer into somewhere that I don't control anymore, somewhere where the data really isn't. Imagine sort of the example, the trivial example of this. Here, I change z dot data zero to be like false, or I guess one. The z dot half still points to f, which has been dropped, so that's not okay. But even if it was, even if somehow that reference hadn't gone away, this value is now like wouldn't see one for sure. In fact, it would probably just see garbage or something that's been reused. But we need to be able to express this kind of type in order to have async await because this, this future we're waiting on is using the stream. Okay, so clearly there's just something very weird going on here. We need to have a way to express this. Now, there, there have been lots and lots of proposals for adding self-referential data types to Rust. Um, and it turns out it's really quite hard. Of course, one way you could do this is you could say that half is going to be a, uh, a, a pointer, a raw pointer that we're going to manage ourselves. But we can't do that if the user is allowed to just like randomly move foo around. We have no way of guaranteeing that that pointer is always correct. And so really this problem turns into one of can we guarantee somehow that foo does not move once we set half, right? So at some point, we're going to set half. We're going to set the value of half to point into foo, right? Imagine there's some like initialization step, like there's a foo init function or something. And that's going to like create data and it's going to create the pointer of half into data. And of course, there's no way for user code to deal with the, the state in between. So the user code will only ever see sort of the half pointer being set correctly. But if the user ever moves foo, or specifically if data ever changes memory location, then now half would be no longer be correct. And so in addition to there having been uh, proposals that have been sort of how do we create a self-referential data type, it is sort of reduced to how can we express that something isn't allowed to move. So there have been things like impl not move for foo is something we've seen. There have been a lot of proposals for this, but none, none that have really worked all that well. Uh, and this has been a major problem for how do you express async await because we need it for async await. And finally, um, a while ago, without boats and uh, Eddie B and some other people, um, I think without boats was sort of the first one to realize this. Uh, I think he links to the. I think they link to the somewhere here. Uh, to the blog post they wrote, rendered. Uh, without. Without boars, that's new. Uh, without boats block. I guess it's not in my history, that's weird. Yeah, the it's on a different URL, so it doesn't really help me. So, uh, sorry, it's on a different computer, so I can't even get to that here. Um, blog, great. 
confused. Ah, there we go. Um, so down here somewhere, uh, what they basically did was spent a bunch of time trying to think how can we do how can we do async await right so this starts out by talking about self self referential structs um, then sort of talks through well what do we actually need how might we get it and then here they basically realize that we have all the parts we need in the type system we need to just need some very small proposals um, and this was back in January. And this was basically the breakthrough that we needed for how do we express this in Rust. Uh, and then there are a bunch of blog posts since on, on how to polish that API. In fact, there was one very recently on uh, this one. No. Uh, this. This one. No, that's on. Well, it's one of these. Though all of the, anything here that mentions pinning is probably worth reading. If you want to understand it, um, but the observation was that we can we can get sort of support for this. Basically, the thing we want to express with async await that something can't move once we've started, once we've once we have it be self-referential, using the notion of pinning. Uh, and so, pinning. Can you link to the voting site you made last night? Ah, sorry. Yes. Uh, this. Um, Do I have, I probably do, there. Um, sorry, so the pinning API is, is what they came up with in the end. Um, and pinning has a lot of very sneaky details. There's a lot of, um, intricate contracts that are being maintained, but I'll do my best to try to explain what's going on. So pinning introduces two new types. Um, there is a pin, pin type P, uh, where P is sort of a pointer type. So where P implements deref. So there's a, it that way struct pin great uh and then there's a trait called unpin this is a marker trait so it's automatically defined for all types uh by the compiler just like uh clone and sorry just like send and sync um and the basic idea is that uh this is the first question where i really understand the need for pin api and its relation to async await oh i'm glad glad to hear it um so where this gets tricky is remember how up here we need to be able to express the fact that once we've set this pointer, then foo will not move. And that is what pin expresses. So a pin, if you have a function, foo, uh, bar, and you get some argument x, and that argument is a pin uh, so P here is any kind of pointer type. So a mutable reference or reference of arc RC. Um, well, let's say you get a mute T. So take some T. Uh, what this tells you. So if you get an argument of type pin, there's a contract. So basically what if you get a pin, uh, whoever is calling you is promising the following. They are promising that either uh, T will never move again or T implements unpin. Okay, that is the contract. Uh, now, this does not say anything about T if it's not, if you're not, if you're just given a T, right? So T here is any type. And so until you have it in a pin, there's nothing special. All this is saying that either T will never move again the moment you give a the moment you get a pin, right of, of any type. This is similar to if I gave you say a, a box T, right? Then I'm saying that once you get this T will never move again or T is unpin. 
And remember I mentioned that uh, unpin is a, a, uh, an auto trait. So it's something that every type, unless, expli unless it explicitly opts out of it, so impl not unpin, uh, ah, no, 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 uh, what do I do? Uh, not unpin for my type. Unless you have an impl like this, then every, all of your types are gonna be uh, unpinned. Now, the unpin is a little bit of a weird term that there's still some discussion about what these things should be called. Uh, the argument for calling them what they are is that unpin should be read as a verb. So uh, you should read this as, uh, if something is unpinned, it means that it you can, if you're given a pin of it, you can unpin it and that's okay. Uh, so unpin as in a verb, it's not, yeah. Uh, this is saying, if you have a my type, you can, and if you have a pin of a thing to a my type, you cannot unpin it. We'll see how that explains. Uh, no, so it's, the question is, uh, is it auto implemented because it's an empty trait? No. So uh, uh, you can have traits that have no members that are just a contract. Auto traits are special in that the compiler will automatically give every type uh, that trait if all its members are that trait. This is not true for every marker trait. Uh, although that, so that said, um, I don't know of any empty traits that are not auto traits in the standard library. Uh, in other crates, you could usually easily use them for markers of various kinds, but they're not necessarily the same. Uh, yes, so unpin is special. Unpin and pin are known, but well, sorry, unpin is known to the compiler and it has been marked as, so in the standard library, you're allowed to write auto trait, which basically tells the compiler, this trait should be applied everywhere. You cannot define your own auto traits, at least not currently. So it, it is, it's a reserved special trait. It's not as a reserved special name, but it's in the standard library and the compiler knows that it's an auto trait. Uh, and that's why it has this, um, this propagation, this auto propagation. Uh, and so the way to, to think about unpin is, is in terms of this contract, right? Either T will never move again or T is unpin. Uh, and if something is unpin, what that means is, uh, that it is uh, if t is unpinned, uh, it is not sensitive to being moved, sort of, right? So, uh, off topic question about generics, can you specify generic must not implement a trait? Um, not currently? You can only declare that something does not implement a trait. You cannot depend on something not implementing a trait yet, because it turns out to be fairly hard for the compiler to do negative reasoning. Uh, it would be nice for, for specialization, for example, but I don't think you can currently do it. Uh, so think of our referential data type foo up here. So foo would not be unpinned. Or the other way to think about it is, if something does not have any self-references, then it doesn't matter if you move it, right? It's not sensitive to being moved. So even if someone pin it and like, if you moved it, the, you're, it's not like your data structure would break. Nothing would be wrong if it got moved. And so that's why if I just declare like a bar and that has like a B, which is a vec of bool, and maybe some like buff that's a vector u8, and maybe it has like a z that's an arc mutex uh, atomic use. It's a terrible type. Arc mutex hash map tuple of u size bool string. Like who knows? So complicated type. This type is unpinned because it's not sensitive to moving. If you move it, the data structure is just as valid as it was, right? Foo, on the other hand, is sensitive to moving. 
right? But but that doesn't mean that you can't move foo. It's just that once you rely on this half value, once that's important to you, then you can't move foo, right? If you ever, if you, once you know that you're gonna start using half, so once half is something that you're gonna access, then it matters the foo is not moved. So therefore, foo is not going to be unpinned. Uh, so here, we're gonna, we're gonna have in our code, unsafe impul, uh, sorry, not unsafe, impul not unpinned for foo. This is saying that foo is sensitive to being moved. And now what that means is, uh, I guess we can bring this a little bit closer. Uh, unpin is not unsafe. It is always okay to declare a type to be not unpin. You would just, if you do it, you're doing yourself a disservice if it's not important, right? Because nothing, if you say that something can't or is sensitive to being moved, then that just means that people won't be able to move it if it's in a pin. The reverse, on the other hand, is problematic, right? If you have something that is sensitive to being moved, but you don't mark it as such, then that will be problematic. Now, the, the name on pin is a little weird because you end up with this double negation, and that's part of what's going on in the discussion um, in the stabilization effort right now. Uh, we'll see whether or not it changes, but th there's some argument for unpin being the right word, but it... it um, uh, reads somewhat weirdly like when you talk about it it's a little bit weird uh if you create a custom self-referential struct it should impl not unpin yes exactly uh i don't think the compiler is going to be smart enough to do this uh automatically so it because it doesn't know that half or half here points into self right half could be a pointer to somewhere completely different in which case foo is unpinned so it's only because the semantics of half is that it points into self that it is self-referential. And furthermore, unpin only matters in the context of pin. So unpin on its own is not important. It is only important in the context of pin. And we'll see exactly how that all ties together. Um, but imagine that I set half um, and then I just like never touch half again, right? So half is pointing into self, but it's just like never used. Then of course, obviously foo is still unpinned because even if foo is moved, nothing's gonna break on foo. Or for example, imagine that I do some, um, uh, what's a better example of this? Uh, we'll see how this ties into futures later, but I think that's the basic idea. Um, okay, so why does this all matter? Well. If you're given a T that is unpinned or not unpinned, you can move it all fine. Unpinned does not restrict moving in any way. However, if you are given a pin of a type, then the contract is that either T, so the, the target, so let's actually write this out. Um, there's an impl deref, uh, impl, it's gonna be a PT deref uh, for, in P where P uh, D refs into T. I need to make sure I get this implementation right. I, th I think this is right. Target is PDF. Okay, so this DREF exists for pin no matter what the type is, right? Because if you if I give you a read-only reference to the target of P's pointer, then it's still not gonna move, right? You're just gonna read it, that's fine. DREF mute is where it gets interesting. So DREF mute for pin. Uh, where p implements deref mute. Uh, here. Sorry, the sorting here is a little bit important for clarity, so I'm going to take a little bit of time. Uh, and t implements unpin. Yes. 
like so. Yeah. So uh, notice the pin always implements DREF into the target of the pointer, right? So that's the thing up here. And it does so unconditionally, right? As long as P implements DREF, which is like box implements DREF, arc implements DREF, RC implements DREF, most things implement DREF. Uh, pointers, uh, references, of course, implement DREF. DREF mute is where it gets interesting. So imagine that we just implemented DREF and we did not have this restriction. We just said that it also implements DREF. Um, this is problematic because this gives me a mutable pointer to T. So what I could write now is um, the code that we had above up here, right? So I have a, um, uh, I have a foo, well, actually I have a, I have a pin box foo. All right, so remember, foo is, is uh, not unpin, so it's sensitive to being moved. Um, and I have one of these. Now, because it implements DREF mute, what I can do is I can use mem swap or mem replace on the DREF of F, right? So DREFing F is gonna give me the mutable DREF of the box, which is foo. So this gives me a mutable pointer to foo and I can just replace that with some other foo, right? There's nothing stopping me from doing this. It's totally safe. The problem, of course, is now I just moved foo. So if I previously gave someone this pin, then the guarantee that I gave them, namely I told them that T will never move again if T is not on pin, right? So this sort of imply this the statement down here implies that if t is not unpin, then it will never move again. Foo here is not unpin, so therefore it should never move again once I have it in a pin. But here I'm causing foo to move, right? The old uh, z here is now going to be the old foo. So foo, the 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 old thing that was inside f has now been moved, and so this is clearly not okay, right? And so the sort of insight here is we're going to require T to be unpin for, uh, for DREF mute to work for pin, for this to be safe. Now, this will not compile because foo does not implement unpin. So this code will not compile. In fact, now we guarantee that just foo will never move. Once you put it in a pin, there's no way to get it out of the pin. Like pin doesn't have a way to destruct it, right? And you cannot deref mute it. So you can't get a mutable reference to T. And so therefore you're not gonna be moving T. You don't have a way to move it, right? So this is the core insight of pin that you can only get a mutable reference to the thing inside of it if it is unpinned, if it's safe, if it's not sensitive to being moved, right? Now, of course, there's one thing you can observe here, which is if I have some code where I know that I'm not doing mem replace, right? Uh, I have some code where I, I just want a mutable reference into foo because I'm gonna change a string in there or something. That's all fine, I'm not moving foo, right? I'm not doing mem replace, I'm not moving foo in any way, then I know because of the code that I've written that it is safe for me to look at, look beyond the P in a mutable way. And so that's why pin P, uh, there's an implementation on pin, uh, which is unsafe uh, uh, as mute. I don't remember exactly what it's called, but it's not important. Uh, it gives a mute uh, P, Wait, this should be target. This should be target. Uh, P target. Uh, self Yes. 
So, uh, so I can have this unsafe, this unsafe as mute, which given a, uh, I guess this is going to have, uh, this is going to have where, um, P implements the ref mute, right? So this is saying this function is going to basically just do a deref mute as well, but it's unsafe because it will only give you that mutable reference if you promise that you're not going to move the target. Right? Um, does the compiler consider deref mute similar to deref because of the names? Um, no, no, the compiler doesn't do that. Although, dere so the, the trait deref mute uh, extends deref. So in order to implement deref mute, you also have to implement deref, but it has nothing to do with the names. Uh, is it kind of sad that you can't get a mutable reference to mutate it, but not move it? I think your answer, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the answer, the uh, it would be sad if you had no way of getting at the thing that P points to if you sort of know that you're not mutating it. And that is exactly what we're getting at here. We do have an unsafe way to get to the target but the, the unsafety here is you need to promise not to move T. Basically, you need to manually uphold this con contract that T will never move again, right? If, if you're unpinned, if your target is unpinned, you know that it doesn't matter to the type whether it's moved. And so therefore it's fine. We, we can give out the mutable reference because if someone chooses to replace it, that's fine. Foo doesn't care. And the fact that we, the thing that we promised in the past was just that if we move it, it's not gonna matter. Uh, so this unsafe implementation comes along with this contract that you don't replace it. Notice, however, though, that pin is only one level deep, right? So if I, uh, if inside foo, there was something like a box string, uh, box use size, no, has to be string. Uh, so foo now has this, has also itself has a pointer to a string. Notice that it, using only safe code, it is totally fine for us to say, uh, uh, it is totally, f oh, um, I don't know how to phrase this. Um, if we have, Ah, a better example of this is actually the other way around. Bar has a foo. Uh, box foo. If we have a pin bar, right, then it is totally fine for us to deref this because bar is um, bar is unpinned, right? So. It is totally fine for us to now move the foo inside of bar. There's no problem with that. All we promised here was that bar is not going to move. That's all this pin promises. It does not say anything about foo inside of bar. Um, and this sort of brings us full circle to futures. So pull takes a pin mute self. Now think about what that means. When pull is called, we promise that self will not move or that self is unpinned. And, and uh, keep in mind here that if we have something, so pin also has this uh, uh, as mute self, uh, which returns a pin, uh, a pin of mute p target. And notice that this is also safe, right? So this is turning a, uh, this turns, for example, a pin box foo into a pin mute foo, right? That's, that's necessarily safe. A pin box foo promises the foo will not move and a pin re mutable reference to foo also promises the same. So we've done nothing weird by doing this, right? And so this is an entirely safe method because you still can't move foo if I give you a pin mute foo. You would still then end up having to either use this unsafe or 
the target type would have to be um, unpin. And so this means that if we have a pin box foo, then it's trivial for us if they imagine the foo was a future, then of course now we can easily call f poll. That's fine because this pin can be trivially turned into, well, I guess it would be like ask mute, right? Uh, this pin can now be turned into a pin mute foo. And so if uh, foo implements future, that is the same as a pin mute self. And so now we're given this. And to bring this then full circle to async await, now that we have this pin, we have all the guarantees that we need for async, right? This, the compiler made async block, pinpull not unpin for compiler made async block. We know it's not unpin because there's sort of self-referential stuff going on here, right? But once we start polling, we know that it's not gonna move. And before we start polling, it's fine for it to be moved, right? So if you just have one of these, you can move it as much as you want. It is only the first time you call poll that it's gonna add the pin to it. And so this is why um, in the async await, if we look at what it actually does uh, here, you'll see it pins the future that you give it. It creates the future. So uh, this would be like the foo, right? So it, it um, gets, a, gets the future part of the foo. Then it pins the mutable reference to the foo. So basically establishes the contract that from this point forward, I will not move foo. And then it starts pulling the future. It starts pulling the mutable reference, the pin of the mutable reference to foo. And so now um, inside of here, once we start going into step zero, step one, step two, all of those are calls to poll, which means that we're getting a, a pin of mute self, which means we know that foo will not move. And therefore the self-referential stuff is fine because we know that this will not move anymore. But until you call a wait, until you start pulling it, you're free to move it because we know that it's like in this state where moving it is fine. Uh, today we're going through all of futures and Tokyo and the async await and pin. Uh, I think it will be hard to follow from this point if you don't have an experience with it, but I recommend you go back and watch from the beginning. I think we've done a pretty thorough job of going through all the things. Uh, so whether something is pinnable or not is governed via unpin and not unpin. Sort of. So every type is pinnable. You can always make a pin of some type T. The question is just what is the contract you're establishing? And the contract for all pins, no matter what the type inside of it, is that if you have a pin of something, then either, so remember the, the type of pin is always a pointer. It's either that the target of the pointer will never move again, or that the target of the pointer does not care whether it's moved. It, so for example, it's not self-referential. Yeah? So in some sense, unpin or not unpin dictates which contract you are tied to when you make a pin. And so that is then what enables us to do this because now the, the moment you start polling this, you know that it will not move anymore. Or you, um, or in the case where like you implemented your own future, if your own future doesn't have any self references in it, then it's trivially on pin, right? Self is gonna be on pin. And so therefore writing your future is fine because writing your future, you're given one of these, Self is on pin, therefore the deref mute of the pin is safe and you can use it. And so it's just gonna be, you can basically just write self dot whatever and you get a mutable reference to self. Cause it's on pin, it doesn't matter. Okay, that is pin. And that is what enables us to have async await. Uh, and that is currently what's about to be stabilized. Now, some of the names might change. There's a lot of discussion in this thread uh, and about these double negatives. Uh, the, um, there's one other thing that is the proposal for stabilization adds, and that is um, uh, impl not is currently a nightly only feature. So this is similar to if you want to declare that something is 
not send, like, uh, sorry, if you want to do something like impl not send for my type, uh, this pattern of impl implementing a negative, you can only do for auto traits because they're the only things that are not opt in. This is basically a way to opt out. Uh, this is a nightly feature, but they want to be able to ship pin without shipping that feature. Uh, and so what they're adding is a, um, a type called pinned, which is sort of stupid. But, but in the standard library, sorry, the idea is not stupid. The name is annoying. Uh, so uh, in std pin, they're adding a struct pinned, which has no contents. So it's like uh, similar to phantom data, right? It contains nothing. It's a zero size type. And inside of the compiler, of course, are allowed to use negative implementations. And so there's an impl not unpinned for pinned. The reason they do this is now, um, if you want to, if you, for, so for foo, what we would do is instead of having this requires nightly, right? So instead of doing that, which requires nightly, we just add like a uh, not unpinned this and now because pinned is not on pin foo will be not on pin because the compiler only sets uh, auto traits if all members have that trait right so th this adding this to the standard library means that now even though they don't stand um, stabilize this you can now have things be not on pin on stable uh I've been looking for a more approachable resource to understand all this information related to futures and async await, and I must say this has been the best for that. I'm glad to hear it. I, I do think this is part of the reason I did this stream in the first place was because there's a lot of interconnected components here, and there's a lot of stuff you need to understand, and I think it's actually valuable to go through all of it, like sort of the the entire like ball of stuff, um, because they all interconnect. And understanding all of it is important. So I'm glad you find it useful. Uh, did it require many more compiler features or is it more on a library level? So that is one of the things that is really cool. Oh, sorry, there's a pop-up, it's annoying. Uh, that is one of the things that is really cool about PIN and why I recommend you go back and read those blog posts because there's sort of this gradual realization that we can do this basically without adding anything. So PIN, is not special. It does require that you add an auto trait to the compiler, but adding an auto trait, we don't want to add lots of them, but it's like pretty trivial. That's the only thing you added. And it didn't require a feature, right? It just sort of required um, adding a type and an auto trait for it, which is already something the, sorry, adding an auto trait to the standard library, which we already have all the other auto traits. So there's no feature needed in the compiler at all to add pin. Uh, and then the realization, the pin is all you need for async await. So async await is not, async await does require compiler features, basically because the compiler has to generate this business, right? It has to implement, it has to take code that looks like, it has to take code that looks like this and turn it into this enum and the corresponding impl future. And so that is something the compiler now has to learn to do. Uh, basically sort of know what variables to capture and produce each step of this enum. But that's about it. Uh, but so, I mean, that was somewhat complicated, but it was more the realization that pin is all that's needed to make that work. Um, does that answer your question? I, I think that was what you were asking. Um, Okay, right, so so pinned uh, is the last thing that is proposed to be stabilized in in, uh, in stabilizing pin, right? So the, the stabilization efforts that we're going through are stabilizing task and future. So that needs to go into the standard library to get futures. Uh, future requires pin, so pin is being stabilized. Um, and then async await, the RFC is landed I don't know if the, I don't think there's a stabilization issue for async await yet. Uh, yeah, probably not. 
So this is going to be the, the sequence of things that we're going to stabilize, I guess, pin first because it's needed in futures and then stabilize task in future so that uh, because that's going to be needed in the standard library in order to have async await. And then hopefully we'll see the ecosystem sort of move towards using the standard library future and task stuff. Um, so that would include things like Tokyo has to move to it, which is a non-trivial effort, but the work is sort of underway. Um, the, one of the problems we're having is that the, the sort of pinning stuff, while it is really cool and probably basically what we need, it is a pretty big change to how you write futures because you now need to think about pinning. Uh, and changing all of the ecosystem around futures and especially everything that's built on top of Tokyo and Tokyo itself to use this just requires a bunch of work, um, but it is undergoing. And then once this is stabilized, then at least hopefully we could um, finish the implementation of and stabilize async await. And then hopefully we would just have all of it. Um, but that is still a little bit of a ways off. I think the hope is to have async await in like two release cycles or something. I think there was some discussion about, I don't remember what the conclusion was in this, in this thread. But I think the hope is to get it out pretty soon. Although it's a trade-off, right? Because these are really tricky things and you need really good documentations, which is one of the things that's currently kind of lacking. Um, if you look at the both the RFCs and the implementations in the standard library that they're proposing to stabilize, the documentation is okay. But this is why I made the stream as well, right? To try to give people more wholesome introduction to all of the concepts, the concepts that are involved. And the documentation of the standard library isn't quite there yet where it gives you that kind of full interconnected um, picture of what's going on. And so my hope is that that's something we get into uh, or, or manage to make it part of the stabilization effort. Um, but so we don't want to sort of stabilize in a rushed way, but I do think we're getting to a design where now we're understanding why all the pieces are there. And hopefully now you understand it too, um, in such a way that we can get to async await, which we all really want in like a reasonable fashion. Um, I wrote a little crate with one trait that wraps many pointers, many pointer types into a pin type. It's called pinpoint. That's a great name. Uh, you can call pointer as pin. Yeah, so there's um, there's a bunch of work on building. So one of the things that's complicated about pin is uh, you want to be able to say, uh, if I have a pin, if I have a pin to bar, sorry, pin to box to bar, or I guess at new bar, uh, is there a way for me to go to a pin mute foo, for example, um, specifically like sort of project into this field is, or it might not be the best example. Let's go with that one anyway. Is there a way for me to do this safely through uh, bar dot foo? Uh, it turns out it's actually fairly difficult to express what the requirements are here. The requirements basically, if I remember correctly, is, uh, oh, actually that's separate. Um, yeah, so so exactly what this, uh, what you need for this is a little unclear. There's um, a crate though that's intended to do this for you, which is this pin utils crate. Um, I think, I think it was pin utils, I could be wrong. Uh, it might be mentioned here somewhere. Yeah, I don't remember where it is. Yeah, pin utils. Okay. So pin utils has a basically convenience methods for interacting with pinning. Uh, pinpoint is probably a similar kind of thing. Um, and the hope is to provide some kind of mechanism for exp um, for giving out this kind of sort of transitive pinning. Where you can say that if bar is pinned, I can give you a pin of foo. 
but we don't have exactly the mechanism for that yet. Um, the the only other things I wanted, there's one more thing I wanted to mention, which is, and you may have seen this already, um, for this, uh, fn mu, in fact, we can look at this here, um, creating a new pin based only on a reference, uh, no, that's not the one I want. Uh, right, so the, the RFC goes through basically everything we've gone through here, but for new, I, don't, I think this is missing something from a while ago. Yeah, this, this RFC is a little bit older. This doesn't include, there was an older version of pin that had like pin and pin box and pin arc and none of that is no longer needed. What what I give is still the, is sort of the new instantiation, but I guess this isn't the right one. Um, if we go to the top here. Uh, I specifically wanted to show you the constructor. So there's a safe constructor when the target is unpin. There's an unsafe constructor if the target is not unpin. And I want to explain why that is. Uh, so we're going to require that P implements deref. Oh, I guess that's actually something I've missed in all of this. Like all of these need to have the bound P is deref. Um, if you want to create a new, this is actually unsafe. Uh, pointer P uh, gives you a self. Uh, unsafe. So the question is, why is it unsafe? Right, so there's a there's a safe implementation, which is uh, if p target implements unpin. So this is safe. But why is this not safe? This has this basically just does this. So that's safe. Why is this unsafe? Um, the reason is, I. Uh, we basically want to avoid in, in the case where you don't have, where you have a type that is not unpin, we want to avoid ever giving out a mutable reference to T, right? Because if we do, you can mem replace and now the, the value moves. Imagine that I write sort of a, a malicious, if you will, like I write like bad box. And what bad box does is uh, it just contains a box T. And I implement deref for bad box, right? Let's just ignore what the implementation is. And then I implement deref mute for bad box. Uh, deref mute. And it gives out a mutable reference to the thing underneath, right? zero right so this all seems fine this is all fine but here for a brief sec is a uh, yes for a brief second here I have access to a mutable reference to T in deref mute right bad box whenever the pin chooses to mute to go through deref mute I as bad box implementation of deref mute I can mutate self. So imagine the bad box in deref mute does a mem replace. With like T default or whatever, or who, who knows, mem uninitialized. I just moved the T, right? But the target is not unpinned, but I move T after it's been pinned. And so clearly that's not okay. And so the reason that we need new to be unsafe, even th that we need new to unsafe when uh, T is not unpinned is because we need to guard against this. We need to make sure that at no point does anyone have a mutable reference to T and do something like this. So the unsafe here is also like, I promise that my deref mute does not move T. 
It's basically the promise you're making in new unchecked. Uh, so if foo contains a unpinned, there is no unpinned. Uh, are you talking about pinned or are you saying that foo contains a type that is unpinned? Uh, so pinned, a lot of code on the screen now. This pinned is really just, it is really just this. It's a way to uh, opt to say that your type is not unpinned without having to write this line, which you can't write on stable. That is the only thing that pinned does. Um, pinned, that is P-I-N-N-D, like this thing. Uh, that is the only thing it does. Now, if foo contains, if foo contains something that is unpinned, that does not matter. Uh, pinning is just a guarantee about the immediate dereference and nothing else. I hope the documentation for new unchecked will explain the required invariance and reason for them. Yeah, so this is one of the things that's going on in this uh, discussion is uh, there's been a lot of discussion about like exactly what should the doc say. And I, I learned a lot of this from reading the stabilization thread. Um, I don't know what it says now. It has changed a little bit, but the, the plan is certainly that it should, um, that, uh, that all the documentation will explain exactly what all the invariants are because they are really subtle for pin. It is really, un it's really subtle why all these things work and why it ends up being safe. And I'm, I am positive that like throughout the things I've told you, there are probably things that are false, but you know, it's, you gotta, you gotta start somewhere. Um, Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, you saw the my paper in the morning paper. Yeah, that was pretty fun. Um, it's interesting because I have I have had a bunch of academics that have said it the other way around. That it's interesting to see someone who's an academic be in Rust circles. Um, okay, I don't think there's anything else I wanted to talk about. Sort of futures or Tokyo or async await. Uh, is there anything that you feel like you would like to hear more about um, in any of the stuff we talked about so far uh, or other things you'd like me to cover uh, about this stuff? Uh, anything that's still unclear you want me to go into or you want me to talk more about the sort of directions we're going forward? Because now is sort of the, now I think I've given you the, the entire package. Uh, and if there are still things that aren't clear, I think now would be a good time to cover it. Uh, while you're thinking about that, I will go pee.
Let's see. Uh, what comes for the next stream and when do you plan it? Um, so if you missed it in the beginning, uh, I wrote this website. This is a previous stream that's been filed um, where you can vote on what upcoming stream ideas you'd like to see. It uses ranked choice voting. It's pretty cool. Uh, you just pick a unique username and then you drag and drop the, uh, the ideas into which ones you would rather see me cover. Um, the next stream will probably be in three weeks, probably. I have a bunch of plants coming up. We'll have to see. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it looks like the next thing is going to be porting Flame Graph, which is a CPU profiling tool or visualization tool that's really cool uh, to Rust. We probably won't pro uh, port the entire thing, but it's, uh, it, it would be a slightly different stream. So it wouldn't talk so much about async and stuff, but rather do a more performance oriented thing, um, which I think could be really fun. So it looks like that will probably be the next thing, but feel free to vote there. That'd be a good idea. Um, uh, what is this channel about? So this channel is about the Rust programming language. And in, in particular, um, uh, introdu introducing more advanced concepts and talking about and writing more intermediate or advanced level Rust codes. So you can see like real code being written. Um, I think, yeah, I think watching the full recording later is probably a good idea. There's a lot of details here and it might be hard to follow in real time. Um, I recommend you also go back and sort of draw some diagrams for yourself and see if you can explain it to yourself why this is uh, this is correct. There are lots of details that I've sort of skimmed over or skipped. Um, and so feel free to try to dig into some of this documentation yourself. Um, that's a good point. Uh, Tokyo has recently done sort of a, a, a big documentation effort. It's still underway. Um, but if you go to Tokyo RS documentation, there's now here, so uh, no, going deeper. This section in the Tokyo documentation has recently been written and is basically going into things like the runtime model. Like why, oh, you need to probably. Hmm? Great. Uh, it goes through things like what is, uh, Exactly. How do the runtimes work? Uh, how do you? How do the executors work? How does the work stealing work? Uh, how do you interact with I/O and reactors, timers? Uh, how how would you build a runtime yourself, and what do you need? Um, there's also Tokyo internals, which is still being written, that goes into even more detail, even more stuff about reactors and non-blocking I/O. I really recommend you go read this. Um, there's also the doc push repo which is all about improving the documentation for Tokyo. And so, especially now that you watch the stream, I highly recommend you go like look at this uh, and see, so there are a bunch of issues about where we would like more documentation to be written. If you feel like there are things that you now understand, or even if there's things you're still learning, like try to con contribute to this because you could really help people understand how futures work, how Tokyo works, how the ecosystem works, how async await and pinning works for that matter. Like contribute to this small and large would be really helpful in order to improve the documentation of the ecosystem. And that includes the standard library too. Like if you can help improving the documentation for stuff in the standard library related to this, especially sort of futures and pinning when that lands, that's great. Um... Is there anything in Rust for CSP or actor-based concurrency? Yes. Um, in particular, the, uh, there's a crate called Actix, which is all about implementing the actor model in, uh, in Rust. And uh, I haven't used it too much myself. It builds on top of Tokyo. Um, I don't know exactly how the integration works. Um, but it's basically you have a bunch of things that are actors that operate on their own state and they only communicate by sending messages to one another. Uh, this is very similar to like the Erlang model um, and it's supposedly very good. Uh, there's a, it's primarily built for something called uh, Actix Web, which is a web framework that uses actors to build sort of a microservice oriented architecture for websites. Um, and I've heard good things. And now you may be better uh, better equipped to understand how Actix works under the scenes too. Uh, I don't know how well this is documented for how the asynchronous part of it works, but at least now maybe you have a better understanding of how the internals might work. 
uh, for CSP, not really. Uh, there's been some discussion about adding support for a yield keyword in Tokyo, but you sort of need it to be at a lower level than that. You almost need it to be a compiler feature basically to give you continuations. Um, but now with async await, it might be that you can express CSP and yield in particular using async await. But I don't know that there are any immediate plans to do that. Um, but I think that's something you would need to get closer to true CSP. Um, when implementing my own future, I'm fairly sure I understand what to do if I need to return not ready. But maybe do a two minute example of a simple custom future. Uh, a simple custom future. So um, there's one more thing I want to highlight before I do that. Uh, one of the goals of async await is that you shouldn't need to implement future yourself as much because you should be able to just use async functions and async blocks and async closures and await to just write out what you would normally have done in the implementation of the future, right? Um, so this basically means that you, uh, like many cases where you would previously implement your own future and sort of keep an enum where you walk between different states, like are you connecti connecting to google.com? Google are you writing stuff out? Are you reading stuff back? Um, and sort of manually handling the state machine of that future, you could just do as an async function instead using await and it will be a lot easier to write. Um, as for the contract with not ready, it is really just a matter of any time you return not ready, make sure that something is gonna wake you up. And remember that you can always assume that if something else returned not ready to you, then they have arranged for them to be woken up. So you don't have to do it. So this contract really applies transitively. Usually, uh, th that is actually worth pointing out, in the futures crate, there's a macro called try ready. And what try ready does is pretty much, um, it pretty much looks exactly like this. So the idea is that if you call, if if you have some struct like my future, and you have a bunch of fields, uh, and one of them is you like your future or x, you have some inner thing that implements future of some kind. Then, when you're implementing future for your own future, right? Then you're gonna have a poll. Gonna return poll item. So remember that um, poll is just a, an alias for this. Uh, or I guess if we're gonna do sort of new fancy futures, then really uh, it's just gonna be this now. Remember that how um, future 0 0.3 just got rid of the error. So we can just get rid of all of that error and result related stuff. So if you implement future for your own future, then like you're gonna do a bunch of things in poll. And at some point, 
you are going to pull the inner future, right? Then you have to be prepared for the fact that the inner future might return not ready, in which case maybe you can make no progress, right? Uh, but, it, but it might also return something, in which case you can make progress. And the try ready macro lets you do this. And so that's gonna, it's basically like the question mark operator, except for futures. This is going to be, if poll returns not ready, then just return not ready from me as well. Otherwise, give me the thing that was inside ready. Uh, the reason this works uh, is, remember, this means that you're returning not ready. And the question is, have you, have you arranged for yourself to be woken up? And the answer must be yes, because this inner future also must maintain that contract that if it returns not ready, it has arranged for the task to be woken up. So it returned not ready and will be woken up. So when you return not ready, you will be woken up because it will be woken up. And you're on the same task, right? Any, any chain futures are on the same task. Um, and so that is usually, when you're writing your own futures, that is usually the way in which you uphold that contract. It's just that you're using other futures that are themselves upholding the contract. Uh, doesn't await use the yield keyword internally? Uh, <laughs> I sort of lied. Um, sorry. Uh, where is my... Yeah, erased it. Yeah, probably. Okay, so if we go back to async await. Uh, so down here. this, right? So remember how we talked about what await sort of expands to? See how the RFC says roughly expands to this? So as it says, the yield concept cannot be expressed with existing Rust code. And it's not really yield, right? It's really um, store all the stuff, all the stuff on the stack into the struct that I generated, right? Into this special future that's like the async future and then return not ready. But it's also not just that because it also needs to say the next time you basically, uh, the way to think about this might be when it when the compiler constructs this enum for something like, oh, this code is too far away. Uh, let's move this code up. Uh, so we we sort of claimed that this async await stuff turns into an enum like this. What it really does is it um, does like a match on self. And if it's step zero, then it does this. If it's uh, sort of this, if it's step one, Then it does like self dot waiting on dot pole. And it sort of does like try ready of that, right? So this is like the next value, or I guess C, right? And then it, if it does get to that, then it sort of kind of awaits for that. And then it moves like self is equal to step two, right? And here it's sort of like self is step one. You see sort of what I'm getting at? Like this is really what async turns into. Uh, right, like self dot whatever, I guess waiting on dot poll. So this is, uh, and then self 
is step three. So th this is how it gets around that problem of not re-executing the previous stuff is because each of them is in a separate step. And so it just uses the self because self is an enum. It uses it as like a, uh, as a state machine so that it can move between the different parts uh, without executing the previous parts again. And so this is why the, the yield inside of a weight is not really a yield. It is like a set self kind of thing. Um, yeah, so, so, so this is why uh, Brian mentioned a while ago that, like, uh, that you can sort of talk about async as generators. And that is true. You can sort of think of them that way. But they're not really generators. They're just magically, or not magically created, but just very carefully constructed enums with matching. Uh, and they really are special. They, like, they require the compiler to generate very particular code. Uh, the Patreon link. Oh, I should remove that from YouTube. Yeah, the, because I'm an international student in the US, uh, it turns out that I'm not allowed to have other sources of income. And so I had to shut down my Patreon, which is kind of sad. But such is life. Um, I guess I, uh, in some sense, I didn't start to do this to like make money either. I think it's, it, it, I think it's fun to educate people and I think it's uh, fun to write code. And I think it's fun to have people to interact with while building things and sort of getting you feedback as we go. So that is sort of my reward. Um, but it, it was a bummer, but there's not, nothing I can do about it, sadly. But thanks, I appreciate the sentiment. Um, I think, I think that's all then, unless there are any more outstanding questions. Uh, I don't think there's anything more. So a lot of content we've covered. So like going back and looking over it one more time is probably not a bad idea and sort of drawing things. This is uh, pretty drawing too. <laughs> well, in that case, if there are no more questions, uh, I think we're just gonna end it there. Four hours, it's pretty good, very good. Um, I hope you found this useful, helpful, educational. Um, I hope the the ecosystem around futures uh, and async computation in Rust makes a little bit more sense now. Um, if you have other questions, then feel free to sort of reach out. I'm on Twitter, I showed this earlier, but I am this person. <laughs> uh, so feel free to reach out there or send me an email. Uh, and then I will be happy. I'm also on Mastodon now, for those of you who are a little bit more paranoid about like privacy and not wanting to give Twitter control over your social spheres. Um, so I'm here as well. If you want to follow or message me there, I, I pay attention to that too. Uh, reach out if you have questions. If you have ideas for upcoming streams too, I will add those happily to the, the voting site that we now have. Um, it will remember your votes. So if I do one stream and then I do a second stream, it will still tally up sort of your, the remainder of your votes. Uh, but you do want to check back every now and again to see if there are new things to vote for, if the, those may be of interest. Um, I also really highly urge you to contribute to the Tokyo documentation push. Um, part of it is also not about Tokyo. Like the, the doc push is all about documenting basically all the stuff we've talked about today and the futures in the async ecosystem. Uh, of course, it's a focus on Tokyo, but it also discusses just what are futures like, what's the execution environment like, uh, and contribute to that because it's gonna help other people find better documentation to learn from in the future. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm glad you all came to join. Have a great rest of your Saturday and I'll see you in three weeks time, I guess. Bye.